So hi, uh, I'm uh, Pradeep Gowda. I work uh, here in town with uh, Proofpoint. Um, I've been part of this uh, community for almost uh, 10 years now, maybe another uh, few months. I think I should get the 10-year uh, plaque, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think this is the second time uh, I'm uh, speaking at the uh, Pythology conference. Uh, uh, the previous uh, one was, I think, about uh, the web framework shootout. Um, I talked about Flask. So it's been a while since I uh, talked here. Uh, but it's always a uh, great pleasure to come and talk to uh, you know Python folks. Uh, so today I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, you know intrusion detection systems. You know, in the previous talk, uh, Kevin mentioned that you know security is not you know thing in time. You know it's not a fixed you know thing in time, a slice of time that you can uh, do something and then move on from it. It's an ongoing thing. So what is really good at doing things on an ongoing basis? A computer, right? So if you can do some of the security stuff in an automated way and you know, uh, make the computers do the heavy lifting for us, uh, it's good. We should take uh, an advantage of that. So I think intrusion detection systems are uh, a, a small part of uh, your entire security posture. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, it's a fairly uh, sophisticated and uh, well-established field. However, uh, I felt that you know not many people outside the security community might know about this. So um, this is a you know, good time to sort of go over and understand uh, um, what this is. So I've been, of course, I mentioned all these things. Uh, one important thing about uh, Proofpoint is uh, I joined. Uh, I mean, the, the team that I work for is called Emerging Threats. This is an Indiana-based company. So started in Indiana, and we'll actually hear more about this, but uh, uh, this was acquired by Proofpoint in uh, 2015. Uh, so this is a homegrown security company that is probably very well known across the world in the security industry. Uh, and this is a matter of pride and uh, you know, a joy for all of us, <laughs> I guess, because it's a fairly successful company in what we do. Uh, so this, that was acquired by Proofpoint in uh, 2015. Uh, and I continue to work on the emerging threats uh, side of things. And uh, I deal with uh, intrusion detection systems on a daily basis. I mean, of course, you know, when you talk about any technology, there are you know, different as aspects to it. So I'll, I'll go and talk about more about that uh, as it comes along. But Sarkar uh, uh, has been like some, one of the things that you know, is at the back of everything uh, my team does. I work for a team called Threat Intelligence Engineering in Proofpoint. So essentially, my role uh, is to bring in threat intelligence data from outside uh, to, to be used inside the company, to augment what data we have. Uh, so we're talking, talking about uh, intrusion detection uh, data. You're talking about virus total. You're talking about all kinds of you know, threat intelligence that is out there. Uh, we bring it in and then augment that with uh, what we do and uh, try to you know, help our customers to um, you know, defeat uh, the bad people. So this is what we do. In summary, of course, we do a lot more, but these are some of the uh, things that our proof point is known for. Um, so we help uh, customers, you know, uh, prevent fraud, and then, uh, of course, uh, email protection. And uh, so there is something called as targeted attack protection. Uh, essentially, we, you know, uh, the the security uh, domain is very sophisticated right now in the sense that the people who attack, uh, you know, juicy targets, I can say. Uh, they don't go after, you know, like just send something out in the world and see what uh, sticks. Well, that also happens, continues to happen. But a lot of it is very targeted. That is, they, you go after one specific person, one CFO or one CEO of a company. So that is more and more prevalent these days, and uh, we help our customers uh, sort of, you know, guard against that. Uh, of course, we have mobile defense, social media protection, and things like that. Uh, but uh, I fall under the threat intelligence part. So I just talked about that. Uh, so, cyber. It's a very funny word. I never liked the word, but that's what people talk about. So, cyber things, right? So, what is the state of cyber things? For, for most people, uh, so I have uh, antivirus on my system. Antivirus? Really? Are you kidding me? That's not going to do anything. I mean, it's not at all effective. I mean, it is to a certain extent, but it's not, you know, you cannot say that since you have an antivirus, you are going to be protected by all the badness that's out there. That's only one small part of it, right? And what about firewalls? You know, one day, yeah, you are, I don't know, maybe your CTO, maybe this was in the 90s, said, Jay, 
Jake, listen to me. I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to make the bad guys pay for it. <laughs> okay? But that's so 90s. I mean, it's like firewall, really? I mean, it works. I mean, it's not like you, you can actually drop your firewall tomorrow and then, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I'm secure. No, you can't do that. You still need to have firewalls. You still need to have antivirus. But that's only, uh, you know, a small part of the entire picture. The wall is a lie, you know, because there are so many things that are happening behind the wall that are more dangerous, right? Bring your own device. This, this probably should, you know, sort of uh, strike fear into every CISO's heart or your SecOps people's hearts because I don't know what Android device that you are going to bring into my network and I don't know what websites you are going to open. It may be even completely benign, like Gmail, but a lot of the attacks today happen through uh, you know, employees uh, who bring G open Gmail in their uh, you know, office network, okay? It doesn't have to be, you know, something that comes to your official email. People use Gmail all the time. Sometimes they even use it for work. You, it's very hard to avoid that sometime. So you open Gmail and then you're bringing in uh, stuff, uh, you know, within the network. Uh, no, nothing to say about all the other devices people might bring in. And of course, you know, this is probably a little more, you know, 95th percentile and you know, a smaller occurrences, but still, and you, know, you run so many systems in your network. Do you know if all of them are patched? Do you think all the uh, OSs, all the virtual machines that you use from a third party vendor, they're all patched, they're all secure? No, I mean, a lot of stuff out there. Of course, this is my favorite. This is my favorite bugbear, you know, the Internet of Things. You now, there's this famous uh, Twitter account called the Internet of Shit. It's a very um, funny account, but it's also funny because it's so truthful, right? I mean, just yesterday I was going through the uh, tweets to see, you know, what is like really funny. So this uh, new Philips bulb has a REST API, okay, that you can use to do stuff to it. I mean, come on, this should scare you, right? Anything that has an API, that anything that has a gate or a door into it will be abused. So we don't need more of that, right? Of course, this is, then I, <laughs> they trace the call and it's coming from inside the house. That's what IoT does to you. But this is so 90s or whatever decade this was in. But this is for the cool kids. <laughs> she traced the killer's IP address. It was in the 192.168 slash 16 block. It's coming from inside. So, of course, you know, there's a lot of evidence of this happening, you know, uh, we, we hear about uh, fridges getting hacked uh, and, you know, all kinds of stuff getting hacked. Uh, we were in uh, Home Depot a few months ago looking for a fridge and then, of course, you know, there was this beautiful uh, fridge that had, uh, you know, a huge screen and then, you know, you could, you know, touch it to get weather information, could sync your calendar and all that. And I told my wife, I mean, she's a techie too. I told her, let's not even think about it because I look at this and then I see all the stuff that can go bad with this. This is just waiting to be you know, hacked. I don't want this in my house. I don't want any smart stuff in my house because I know what all bad things can go wrong. So, yeah, so fridge, I don't want fridge to be attacking me. You know? <laughs> so, of course, we have heard about all of these bots, uh, you know, the toasters and the um, bulbs and the uh, wireless routers. And cameras, they all becoming part of a huge zombie network that attack infrastructure that are used by you know state actors to go after whether it's private companies or other you know public entities. This problem is never going to go away, right? I think this was funny, uh, not just because you know they've actually taken time to uh, you know show us how each of this can be compromised, which is funny and scary. But I think the really funny part is about the um, thing that's a CO2 sensor, the smoke alarm at the top right. You can see 30 bucks in Bitcoin. Wow, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> that's like a million dollars, I don't know. Maybe not a million dollars, more like 30 to $19,000, whatever that is. You know, so more than $50,000, wow, that's a big ransom. Maybe that's when you know, you're going to call the FBI because it's a huge amount. 30 Bitcoins, are you kidding me? 
So anyway, um, I mean, I'm not trying to make fun of IoT, I know, because especially, you know, in uh, launch features, you know, we have a big IoT community. But, you know, uh, Internet of Things, you know, I feel like, you know, it's something that people get excited about, buy, but then quietly regret later, because there is a lot of pressure to go to market. And then so people do uh, things that they have to do. They use whatever the embedded framework that is hottest out there, and then they use it. And then there is very little thought given to things like you know security and patching and upgrading. So I'm not just trying to rag on the Internet of Things, but that sort of you know is like a um, uh, good illustrator of uh, things that are everywhere but that can go wrong. Of course, I'm trying to sell an idea here. So. My idea to sort of combat all this badness is an IDS. Okay, so what is an IDS? So it's a basically a, you know short name or a popular name for uh, network intrusion detection systems. Uh, it's a software that is capable of uh, doing uh, real-time analysis of network traffic. It can you know, apply predefined rules. Uh, you can say you know this is how the bad stuff looks like today. You know, this particular botnet or malware is doing rounds. I know this is a signature or the, you know, the pattern that, you know, we can use to detect it. So make this a rule and apply this rule to everything that comes in. Tell me uh, if you see this. So essentially that covers what an IDS does. And then, of course, you know, you want to log interesting things because you're not always going to look, keep looking at the screen, right, 24 hours, right? I mean, the computer is good at doing uh, that, as in looking, looking at stuff. So you want the uh, program to log things so that you can go back and you know uh, do an audit and then look at what happened you know what came in uh, when and who actually brought it in whether it was through a website or was it through something you know uh, that came through a you know, la laptop in the network whatever so you want to log stuff so at the uh, lowest level uh, essentially ideas is something that processes packets so uh, it's something that probably sits at the edge of your network uh, you know, just behind, let's say, a firewall, uh, and then looks at everything that comes in, okay? And then, you know, it decodes packets, and it uh, does a reassembly of packets, you know, if, because if it's TCP, it could be out of order and stuff like that, so it assembles so that, you know, it can actually get a sense of the actual, uh, you know, the message or the stuff that, that is coming in. And then, you know, it can do things like, you know, a parse uh, HTTP and TLS and all the different proto uh, protocols. And then, of course, once you do that, you apply the rules and you detect something that's uh, in the stream. But the question is, of course, which one? So this is like, you know, one of you going to a, you know, conference uh, of uh, accountants and talking about programming languages. So which one, right? That's always the question. So which ideas? So I'm going to talk about, a f mention a few because uh, some of this may be uh, familiar to some of you, uh, but I'm going to talk about one. This is uh, sort of uh, interesting to me because uh, I have run, um, you know, failed to ban on my server, web server. Basically, it looks at, uh, you know, log files, like uh, var log files, and then if somebody is trying to, you know, log into a system all the time, you know, it blocks. Uh, that person or that IP from logging again. So it's a very primitive intrusion detecting system that probably can work at a you know individual server level. Uh, in fact, a lot of us can use it if you're running web servers and blocks and whatnot. So uh, that's fail to ban. That's like a very simple example of that. But of course, not a lot of people uh, in the uh, security industry are familiar with it. In fact, Kevin just mentioned. Uh, base, which is actually a software that, I didn't know about it, sorry, <laughs> I just looked it up. <laughs> so, uh, Snart is one of the, you know, classic uh, you know, IDS uh, uh, systems. So, uh, it's been around, I think, for like close to 20 years now. Uh, it's open source, uh, I think. Um, and then, of course, it's uh, owned by Sourcefire slash Cisco. And then, uh, uh, you know, it does all the good stuff, like sniffing, packet logging, you know, actual intrusion detection. Uh, it's a well-known player in the sense that uh, if you talk about uh, uh, snart rules, uh, most people would know about it. And in fact, it's so famous uh, and popular that you know uh, uh, we have adopted it for one of the you know open source systems that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so a lot of people know about snart. This is another newer player. Uh, this is probably uh, a lot more what do you say niche in the sense that it can do a lot more than I guess snart, but it's also more of an analyst tool. 
um, uh, it, it's more focused on automating what the analysts do, you know, uh, build a, a session of information and then try to reconstruct what happened. Uh, it's uh, a little more sophisticated. But, of course, this is what uh, I'm talking about today, mostly, uh, because uh, there is a long association between uh, the team I work for and Sarkata. Uh, we can think of this as uh, Snort++. Uh, it uses you know, all the threads that are there in your system. You know, it's multi-threaded. It's a highly optimized code. It can use even your graphics card to do detection, and it can use uh, you know, GPUs. It can use uh, things like that. So it's, it's very fast, very performant. Uh, it can do things like file extraction. I talked about, you know, you want to save a file that is bad, you think is bad, you can do that. And uh, the TLS alert extraction is something that is going to become very um, uh, popular as the time goes by because a lot of traffic today is over HTTPS, right? Uh, very few uh, sites actually uh, just use HTTP anymore. If you look at uh, Let's Encrypt, it's basically free. I mean, if you run a blog that you want to protect against whatever, or you want to increase the uh, the SEO rating on Google, because actually Google thinks that you know if you have a secure site, it gives Google gives you a better rating. So there is no reason not to use uh, TLS. I mean, there are good reasons uh, because certificates can broke uh, uh, break, and your site can you know get broken that way. So and keeping up with this is probably a lot more work than. Uh, somebody you know wants to put up a web page on the uh, internet might want to do, so it, it's I mean of course it's also more computing expensive and all that. So there are good reasons not to do TLS, but it's also very easy and uh, you know, quick to do these days. So I guess there are good reasons to do TLS anyway. So even the bad people use uh, TLS these days. So they're no longer serving up uh, executables or plain HTTP. So you cannot sometime look into what's in the packet because it's encrypted unless you are doing something like man in the middle. You know, so unless you want to go that way, a uh, lot of bad stuff can get through because you cannot look at the content. So it becomes important to do something like, you know, uh, use the certificate information itself to identify markers uh, and do you know, uh, further identification. Uh, the other cool stuff about Sarkata is it allows you to write uh, scripts in Lua. Uh, Lua is another uh, language a uh, much smaller language than Python. It's um, actually written for and you know, embedding in other programs, so we can do that. Uh, but we know that any software that has cute mascots is a win, right? I mean, just look at it. <laughs> just look at that. I mean, how can you not use the software? <laughs> Please. Pigs are cute, but uh, not as cute as uh, you know, Meerkat, right? Anyway, this is the official logo. <laughs> Still cute. Um, so, of course, you know, this is free and open source, mature, fast, robust, all that blah, blah, blah. This is built by OIS OISF, Open Information Security Foundation. So, what are the three things that Indiana is famous for? Uh, tender pork loins, right? <laughs> and then Indy 500 and OISF, because this is an Indiana you know, org organization. This is a nonprofit uh, that is based in Indiana, actually, in uh, Lafayette. Um, and then you know, OASF is behind the development of Sarkata. So it's an open source foundation. Um, the development of Sarkata was originally funded by uh, DHS. And there is a long history why this happened. You know, people sort of, uh, people were using SNART, but then some people didn't like the direction SNART was going, so they wanted an alternative. So this was funded, and that's how Sarkata you know, uh, was developed. Um, and then, of course, you know, a lot of the developers and a lot of users and a lot of the analysts of Sarkata actually come from outside the U.S. In fact, the core developer of Sarkata lives in Europe. Uh, so it's a worldwide project. It's not, you know, um, a small team somewhere. It's actually worldwide, pretty big uh, group of people. Um, and Proofpoint, of course, is one of the two platinum highest uh, level sponsors for uh, uh, Sarkata because a lot of what Sarkata brings us is very valuable to the emerging threats team, the threat intelligence team, and proof point. Um, so I already talked about you know some of the advantages if you're considering you know against uh, SNART is you know get most of out of your hardware, and then it can do layer seven uh, level detection you know HTTP, FTP, uh, so things like that which are actually uh, very interesting. Um, and the, this last point is very interesting for. I guess most of us, because uh, whether you like it or not, I don't. I don't like JSON, but JSON is a popular format. 
it's easy. So if a uh, program outputs something in JSON, then it's probably good because you know almost every language worth its salt has a JSON parsing library, uh, and it can um, uh, process the data. So this is how Sargata works. Uh, basically, you have the network sending packets, and then you have the sniffer layer, and then it pro pre-processes that, and then applies the rules uh, that are you know applied by the detection engine to the data, and then it generates alerts and logs, which is uh, you know right written out uh, to various uh, logs and databases. Uh, all this magic happens in uh, uh, rules because the rules tell what Sarkata to look for, and most people just use existing rules because writing rule new rules is you know. Uh, it's pretty, I mean, for programmers, I shouldn't say it's complicated because, you know, we can figure out a lot of complex stuff, but it does require extensive research and testing. Uh, and then uh, the biggest concerns usually are, like, performance, because if you are basically, you know, pumping all your data through, uh, network data through this program, you should be able to handle that load. And then uh, also you don't want to create false alarms. So false positives are a big concern. Uh, so we want to basically test out your rule really, really well. So these are the most commonly used uh, rule sets. ET Open, there is a, a large set of uh, rules which are you know, uh, created by the community and of course uh, supported and tested by the, uh, the ET team in Proofpoint. Plus we also do commercial offerings uh, that is called ET Pro rule set which contains both ET Open and the uh, uh, commercial ones. And I think the SNART uh, rule sets are, are called the VRT, source for VRT. So they are compatible by the way, to a large extent. So a lot of, I use a lot of words, but this is the relationship between all of these things. That's the company I work for. We sponsor OSF. OSF develops Sarkata. Sarkata uses the different rule sets, and then emerging threats is owned by Proofpoint. So if I'm using too many words, that's the relationship. Um, so this is how, uh, I mean, did I miss the rule? So this is how a rule looks like. I mean, you're all programmers, so it should be easy to understand. So the alert is something, an action, and you can have an action that's like drop which is used if you're using uh, Sarkata as an IPS, that is Intrusion Protection System, but let's keep it to just the IDS part right now. Um, so it'll create an alert while looking at the HTTP uh, protocol, and then it looks for any data that is originating in the external net, which you can define in a config. You can say what is external net. I mean, usually it's the entire internet. And then any is basically a placeholder for ports. You can say on which port you're listening for, or which port the data is originating from, and the home net basically defines what you consider as internal network. Uh, so usually it is 192.168 or 10. Dot whatever 10.0 dot whatever uh, network, and then uh, the message is basically uh, what comes out in the log when this fires. Actually, this is a positive identification, and let's skip some of this. So the content is uh, lead hacker. So you're looking for a content that matches that. So if any web page serves this up, then you want it to be al alerted, okay? So that's the rule. And then, of course, you know, there is a lot of metadata associated with it because usually when people download rules, they want to know why this was created. So the reference URLs usually might go to something like a CVE or, you know, like a SIR, whatever, a notification so that you can learn more about it. And then uh, every rule has a unique identification. And then we even version control it so that, you know, you know that uh, this was upgraded or changed or whatever. So this is a very simple concept, but then writing the actual rule, the content part itself, you know, you can use PCRE, that is Perl compatible regular expression. It can get very complicated. So, and also when you use PCRE, you know that if your rules are not good, I mean, it can take some time exponential time. So you, don't, you want to be sure that your rules are correct and performant. Um, yeah, this is the parts I explained. So, cream. So, what is cream? In in <laughs> actually, I didn't know what this the original thing was. Actually, I supposed to. It's like a Wu Tang Clan song. I only knew the the geeky version of it. <laughs> anyway, um, so but for me, it's scream uh, because everything that I do is basically you know goes through Sarkara, you know. So. That is a brief uh, respite from the you know hardcore stuff, I think. So I talked about TLS earlier, saying that a lot of traffic is encrypted, so can we do better? You know, so 
so it does, Sarkata does actually do TLS. Uh, so you can do something like, uh, in this case, a fake certificate where somebody signed a certificate that said it is by Google, but it's actually not Google. So how do you identify something like that? So essentially you are saying uh, that alert, if you see, you know, if the Google user content.com is not signed by that particular authority. Okay, so you're basically doing a string match. Okay. And then sometimes, you know, the fingerprints, the uh, every signature TLS uh, certificate has a uh, fingerprint. Sometimes, you know, you know that bad people have been using the signature for things. So usually, you know, this is something that you share with the rest of the community. So you can actually create a rule saying that, oh, I know that this certificate was used by a bad person for doing bad stuff. So if you see this, then uh, alert me on it. Especially because if that certificate actually um, uh, comes up as something that we have, but actually it's not owned by us, you know, does it make sense? We know what our certificate should look like, but it's actually something else. That means somebody is trying to fake uh, us using a different uh, fingerprint. Um, yeah, file extraction. I mean, if you're into uh, an malware analysis, I think you would love uh, what Sarkata does in terms of you know um, extracting files and stuff like that. Uh, basically, this is what it extracts. It extracts a lot of information about what certificate it sees and the actual certificate itself, which you can use to do really uh, like a lot of detective work around going from the uh, certificate to different IP addresses used by the uh, bad people to different domains they use to uh, you know, sort of send out bad stuff. So you can do a lot of pivoting. There's a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, but how can you use Sarkata? So you can install from scratch. You're all geeks, right? You're all programmers. Using make should be easy. But that's like saying, <laughs> I, I did, I'm very proud of that. Okay, good that you noticed it. <laughs> so, it, it, it is easy if you know what you're doing, but you know, but usually you don't want to, uh, you know, like manually compile from the source because there are better alternatives. Circuit actually has pretty good documentation now. Recently they moved to uh, read the docs, which Python guys, uh, people should uh, like here. Um, but we probably want to go towards something like OpenSense. Uh, which is an appliance based, I mean, sort of forked off of PFSense. So if you're looking for like a more security uh, aware distribution, you should look at OpenSense. They actually use ET Open in their uh, uh, IDS uh, offering. And then this is another thing uh, which contains not just the IDS plus also visualization. I think they use uh, uh, Kibana in their distribution. So this is another uh, thing you can look at. But how do you use the data that comes out? Usually it's uh, through the SIM. Uh, it does a lot of different things, you know, aggregation, alerting, dashboards, compliance, which is probably uh, most people are familiar with as Splunk. If you know Splunk, Splunk loves Sarkada, Sarkada loves, I mean, Splunk, whatever, so it's pretty cool. Uh, or you can use e ELK, uh, that is Elastic Stash, uh, you know, Elastic Search, Log Stash, Kibana, that's an open source stack. Or you can do, use one of our products, uh, we use actually a lot of Sarkata data in uh, Threat Intel uh, offering. You can always go to Sarkata Downloads, I mean, sarkataideas.org, or if you are really interested in uh, training, uh, which is probably a good thing if you are really interested in doing ideas, because this happens all through the year and uh, all over the world, so you may want to get training if you're serious about ideas. Uh, definitely check out OpenSense. I'm really curious about, to know more about them. And thank you. Any questions? Actually, we do have a couple questions up here. Uh, how do you orchestrate between your IDS and the remediation that needs to be taken? Um, can you sort of expand on that? Well, if we need to do something mm -hmm. based on this, what are you, what, how are you integrating like with a salt stack or Ansible or something that's going to do the action? Um, so usually, when you I know uh, you know talking about uh, putting this in a network. So usually the alerting, as I said, the alerting will go towards something like you know the Elk stack, Kibana. You can visualize you know, what alerts are coming in and what severity and things like that. So usually you know people take action based on that. Uh, I mean the Sarkata kind of software itself is you know very hardcore in terms of you know it's uh, very what do you say very niche software. But you need to do something with the data that comes out. But that's left to the actual you know end user. Okay. So what do you do? So what we do is basically run this, you know, I mean, I'm not talking about our SecOps, but usually how people use it is 
they collect the data and then you know like they go and see you know what caused this you know which user brought this in or and they they usually have a remuneration you know strategy that they already have in place but this gives them a data point to go and address that All right, we had a second question, which is, is there a commercial version of Circata? Uh, not as far as I know. I mean, unless you are counting things like what uh, people like Stamus Network do, there is no commercial version. I guess you can use it commercially, but it's also GPL v2 licensed. So it's uh, open source through and through. Yeah. Well, there's, I assume there's some consulting companies who are supporting it? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, you can, of course, you know, get uh, the rules from us or any other developer who uh, does, you know, Circata rules, or you can write your own if you, you learn enough. Uh, but usually the um, security thing is a community-driven effort, so usually you don't want to write your own rules all the time because, you know, that is usually you know you talk to different people and you know, and which is what really drives AT Open really. You know, if you go and see what AT Open is, it is somebody finds that you know this malware is active, so I know how to write a rule to detect it they will contribute back to the, uh, the mailing list. And our people actually help the community in turn by basically running that rule against a lot of QA. I mean, we have a lot of QA infrastructure uh, to make sure that you know, it doesn't harm you know, in terms of performance and you know, it doesn't generate a lot of false uh, positives. That's how we give back. We do a lot of extensive testing. Uh, so that's uh, the way to do it. But plus, of course, you know, the commercial offerings will only like you know, help you, you know, get more up-to-date, you know, cutting edge that uh, ET Open doesn't cover. Cool. Excellent. Well, let's uh, give Pradeep a big round of applause. Thank you for coming out for Pythology. Thank you.